Uh, this morning, we are in week two of our sermon series called At the Movies. And uh, in case you haven't picked up on the theme yet, with our VBS uh, theme this past week was called On the Case. It was kind of about investigating and finding God in life and, and seeing the, the true meaning of lo- our lives is Jesus. And so what we've done uh, is we've chosen four movies over this, pa- this month to look at that have an investigative theme. And so last week we looked at Zootopia. This week we are in the movie Sherlock Holmes. And in case you're sitting there wondering, like, I didn't think I came to the movies, I came to church. You are indeed in church, and the most important thing that we will do today is we will lift Jesus' name high. But one of the things that Jesus did, Jesus did when he walked this earth was he used popular cultural th- things to teach his word, to teach the, the, the methods and, and the person of God. And so what we do in this series called At the Movies is we take a, a popular cultural phenomenon, which is movies, right? Raise your hand if you've seen Top Gun in the house, right? I feel like that's, that movie's about to break every you know, you know, record ever because apparently it's amazing. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not cool. But anyway, uh, we all love movies. Even those who don't like movies, they eventually somehow watch movies. And so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks, including today, is we're going to look into some popular movies and we're going to pull out some timeless truths that God teaches us. And we're going to go back to the Word and see what God says about these timeless truths. So this morning we are diving into the movie Sherlock Holmes. Now obviously it was a book first and then it's been made into movies and TV shows and all the things, but basically what we're doing is we're going back in time to Victorian England. If you've never heard of Sherlock Holmes, you've been living under a rock your entire life, uh, but he is a crazy, uh, smart, also very loony kind of detective, and in this film specifically, what the author, uh, or what the director, Guy Ritchie, looks to pull out is a little bit of the darker side and some of the darker stories of Sherlock Holmes. This specific movie deals with demonic things. And uh, so we're not going to be showing as many clips this morning. Matter of fact, we're not going to be showing any clips other than what we saw this morning because I'm not giving Satan any more time uh, than that trailer right there. We're going to talk and dive into the things of Satan this morning. It should be really fun. The title of my sermon, if you're taking notes, is Spiritual Warfare and How We Battle. Spiritual Warfare and How We Battle. So I, I want you to understand a little bit of what's going on in the movie because I think what the movie represents kind of shows us some pictures of our life. And so Uh, The movie begins by showing the capture and the arrest of a guy named Lord Blackwell. And so what he is, is he's kind of a a, a demonic worshiper, so to speak. Uh, He's a Satan follower, and uh, it is presumed that he has some sort of uh, powers, some sort of supernatural powers. If you know anything about Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, the character himself, is not going to believe in supernatural powers. He's going to look towards evidence, and he's going to let that evidence point him to a natural end, not a supernatural end. And so the entire movie is kind of this battle between Sherlock and Lord Blackwell because what happens with Lord Blackwell over and over again, there appears to be some supernatural things happening. One of the things is at one point Lord Blackwell is killed and three days later, see the coincidence there, he is raised from the dead. And so through the movie they find out that there's this large entity that is kind of controlling all of the English government, and they're kind of satanic worshipers, and there's a lot of just kind of craziness going on and all this, and they get to the end of the movie and they find out that it was really all a farce. It was nothing more than illusion and magic tricks. And Sherlock Holmes kind of looks at the guy and says, you are nothing more than a fraud, and the guy says, I'll be a fraud, but you're going down with me kind of thing. And when I was watching this movie and thinking about our lives, and thinking about Sherlock when when he's in these moments where supernatural things came face to face, although obviously they didn't end up being supernatural. He dismissed them before he could even ever dive into the fact if they were supernatural. I wonder if in a room like this, full of quote-unquote Christians, church people, if when we come face to face with supernatural things in the world, do you and I just quickly dismiss this how there's got to be some sort of natural excuse, some natural explanation of Or are we settled with the supernatural? Are are we comfortable with it? I would be willing to wager that most of us in this room are not comfortable with the supernatural. Uh, If I was to say I had a demon in my house last night, most of you would freak out, right? Be like, what are you talking about? I, I had a member one time even call me and talk to me about demons in their house. And they even said, this might sound like stupid or crazy, like you might think I'm absolutely insane. And I do think this person is insane. I'm just kidding. Uh, But 
they had this issue, and even in sharing it with their pastor, a supernatural thing, they're going, is this natural? Like, is this normal? Can I be talking about this? And so what I wanted to do this morning is just quickly, I thought it'd be fun to kind of go into what does it mean? What does supernatural warfare, or spiritual warfare look like? And who is the devil? And obviously, I've only got about 25-30 minutes, and so we're not going to get every question answered. That's partially why I give you uh, this uh, outline right here. It's got some good Scripture references on there. You can go look at that later. Uh, so our, our primary kind of baseline text in the church that leads us to this place of spiritual warfare is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So prepare to fight against the schemes of the, of the devil. For we do not, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, for, for we do not, uh, go to the next slide, I can't read it. For we do, the rulers against the, uh, there's something wrong with that. Let's go back. <laughs> Ephesians 2. Ephesians 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Essentially what Paul is saying in Ephesians 6 right there is that you need to get prepared. You need to put on the whole armor of God because here's the thing. There are things in your life that you think you are fighting. Natural things. Physical things. And the reality is what you're actually fighting is supernatural things. You think you're fi fighting natural things. You, you, you think you're just feuding with a coworker. You think you're feuding with that gas station who keeps right raising our prices or the president who keeps raising our prices or some other thing in your life. Your, your spouse, your dog who barks at 4 o'clock in the morning and wakes you up every single night. Anybody have a dog that wakes them up in the middle of the night? Good. Praise the Lord. Here's the reality. What, what Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying is, is your struggle isn't against the natural. Your struggle is against the supernatural. Your struggle is against Satan and his army. So the, the struggle in, in your job isn't, isn't your boss, although they may not be the best. Your struggle in your job isn't the customers, all, although we know they are the worst. It isn't your inability to be punctual, truthfully, at, at the base of all of it. Your struggle in your job Somewhere, somehow, some shape or form is the fallen nature of this world and Satan. Your struggle in your marriage isn't your spouse. It's you. No, I'm just kidding. It's Satan, right? And here's the deal. Amy and I have been in, in, in fights before. And, and it's been, the, the presence of a demonic has been like so palpable in the room. When we have been strong enough in the spirit to kind of slow down, like, hey, this fight isn't about what we think we're fighting about. What's actually happening is Satan is trying to divide us right now. We've actually, you know, a few times been able to stop and, and pray together because we've recognized that the fight isn't her, the fight isn't me, although that's probably like most of the time it's me. This specific time, it was 100% Satan getting in between us. The struggle in politics, the struggle in wherever it is in your life. We can try to pinpoint it on somebody else, but the reality is I think what the Bible teaches us over and over and over and over again is that the struggle comes in sin and comes in the form of fighting Satan. Jesus says that the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. And over and over again, what he tells us to do is to prepare ourselves for battle. Like You've heard church people and pastors get up and say, hey, every morning you wake up, you should read the Word. Do you know why? It isn't just because it says it in the Bible. It is because we believe that you should prepare yourself for battle. Uh, Peter actually says to gird your loins. So they, they used to wear kind of like this skirt kind of thing they walked around. If you've watched The Chosen, you kind of have an idea of this. Or even Gladiator, the movie, right? And so what that means is to kind of pull up your skirt that you used to wear and kind of tie it up so that you could be ready for battle because what we're doing every day we wake up and every day we go to the office and every day that we you know have a conversation with our five-year-old is you are going to battle against the cosmic presence of darkness against satan i'm not battling my five-year-old who doesn't want to eat anything but candy for breakfast it feels like i'm battling them i'm battling satan and fallen nature and flesh and so what i need to do is i need to center myself on jesus because he's the only one that's going to be able to give me 
the right thought of mind and the right place of heart to be able to deal with a five-year-old who's screaming at me at 6.30 in the morning, I want Emmy Emmys. That doesn't make any sense, right? You shouldn't have Emmy Emmys. That's M&M's in case you didn't know. That's how my daughter says it. I guess she's four, not five. I'm aging her. But we need to gird our loins. We need to prepare. So part of preparation for fighting is to know who we are fighting. Did you know that the, the name demon in, New Testament, in the New Testament is mentioned over 32 times? The name devil, 36. Satan, 37. All three of these, devil, Satan, and demon, is mentioned for a combined 105 times in the New Testament alone. And yet, most of us, most Christians, we walk through life and we try to know more about Jesus, which is a good thing, but we don't necessarily put the effort into learning about our enemy and how he's going to attack. Every good commander in war, even a good coach of a sport, does at least one thing. They learn their enemy so that they can learn how to fight their enemy. And so this morning we're going to learn our enemy, hoping that that points us to the glorious resolution that Jesus has already won the battle. And all we have to do is get in the army. You know what I'm saying? So, our main text this morning is Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 6. If you'll stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, we'll go through verse 15. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, but putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiveness of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And God's people said, You may be seated. So, what we want to do this morning is I just kind of want to take this text in some chunks and kind of walk through and understand. So, so the first thing that we need to see in this text is that there is a charge against humanity. And that, that charge is that we are less than, right? We are not worthy, we are unholy, we are uh, dead in our trespasses. But the question is, who is leading this charge to? say over and over to us? And the answer, if you're taking notes, is the devil and his demons. The devil and his demons are the ones who are leading this charge against us. And so we want to lead into the next question of, okay, who exactly is the devil? We've been raised to think that he's this kind of red character with, with two horns, and uh, he, he certainly schemes, but Tom and Jerry can, you know, foe with him, uh, and they can, they can fight back and forth. But who, who exactly is the devil? Well, quickly and, and, and as succinct as I can be, it, he's an angel that was created by God. Until he rebelled against God, he became what we now call the devil, and he now opposes God and everything God stands for. Isaiah chapter 14, beginning of verse 12, speaking of the devil, says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star. This is another name for Satan in the Old Testament. Son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, like God, he believes. But you were brought down to Sheol, to hell, to Hades, to the far reaches of the pit. Another, another passage in Ezekiel chapter 28 kind of sheds light on a little more of the position that Satan held. It said, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. This is a division of angels. For so I ordained you, 
The Lord says, you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. The first place that we see the cherubs specifically is in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, the devil's created as an, as an angel, served in the realm, or the, the kind of faction of the cherubs. And, and collectively, they were known as the cherubim. And he was to guard, or they were to guard part of the garden. But yet, sin came in and he fell. And he, when he fell, he was then cursed, as you can read in Genesis chapter 3, along with uh, Adam and Eve, and then the, ultimately the rest of us. And so this fallen nature then corrupts everything around us. But what's interesting is if you read in that, um, I think it was that Isaiah 14 passage, who was hell originally created for? It was not created for you and for me originally. It was originally created for the devil. Matthew 25, verse 4 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So a lot of times we think of hell as a special place for people who are separated from God. And that is true. That is, that, that is a true statement. But ultimately, it was first created for the devil because he sinned first. He fell first in his heart. He sinned against God. He believed that he could be greater than God himself. And so that pride caused him to fall in sin and God cast him out and then he was a part of the unraveling of humanity. What we have brought upon ourselves. This is the villain. This is the one who brings the charge against us. The devil. And then other demons decided to, uh, other angels, I should say, who began to be fallen demons when they turned, followed in his paths. And so this is who is leading the charge against God. This is leading the charge against mankind. So we know who the villain is. We know who the antagonist is. But who, or excuse me, what are their methods? How, how does Satan attack? Because this is the part, the part that I think is very applicable to our life. This is the part that we need to understand. Uh, this is the part that Sherlock would look to investigate and, and figure out, okay, this is the bad guy. How does the bad guy operate? How does, what does this look like in our life? And this is the part that you and I need to kind of lean into. Because there are moments in your lives when you will succumb to sin. You, you, you will see the walls closing in. And what I would like you to see is not necessarily the walls, but how Satan is looking to lead an army against you. And there are ways around this army. There are ways to, to battle back. So, our main, going back to our main text, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, says, see, the, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So when we look at Colossians 2a, when Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, one of the things that he says to them is, hey, one of the ways that Satan is going to attack you is by philosophical thought. In our, in our modern day, you might even be able to say scientific thought, right? Because no longer in the public sphere can science and religion cohabitate. I mean, it should be able to, but what happens? Constantly. You have to choose a side. It, it, it can't be that there's something that we don't know. It has to be. Well, the answer is this. And so if the answer is this, then God can't exist. Right? We had to have evolved from nothing. It couldn't have been ex nihilio, creation from nothing. No, it had to be that we, we came from this, and then we turned into monkeys, and then now we're people. Right? It couldn't, it couldn't, there couldn't be some other type of explanation because science and faith have to go in opposites, at least according to the world. And I don't know that that's true. I don't know what the Bible teaches. So what we want to do is want to lean in. What does the Bible say more about Satan's tactics? Well, number one, it says that he is the accuser. So he will come to us and he will accuse. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. He comes to us and he says, you're not enough. You're not enough. You can't do this well. You can't do that well. God doesn't love you. How could he? See that thought that you're thinking? There's no way God loves you. You you don't deserve this. You don't deserve that. He accuses you day and night. Then he says he's the tempter. We saw this firsthand. What What did he try to do to Jesus in the wilderness? 
He tried to tempt him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent Timothy, this is Paul writing to Timothy, to find out about your faith. I, I, I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. So those of the faith can then be tempted by Satan to abandon the faith, to, to sin, to fall away from God. So he comes to accuse us. He comes to tempt us. And then, what does it say in 1 Peter 5.8? He says he looks to devour us. It says, be self-controlled and alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He looks to completely destroy your life. 100%. He's not merely looking for a tie. This isn't soccer. It's not a win for him. right? He wants you to lose this game. And how does he do this? Well, sometimes he takes on the form of false gods. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. It says, No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. I don't know how you view other religions at times. But what the Bible teaches clearly is that these little g gods in our world, some of them, in fact, are not just innocent you know, try to writings to try to understand the world that we live in. They are literally authored by Satan. So he takes on the form of false gods. He recruits false ministers. Second Corinthians eleven. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. There are pastors in this world that will say, I love Jesus. And they could be no further from Jesus. They have zero desire to be with Him. To, to follow Him. To teach, to learn his, his ways and to then follow with their life. Which that leads us to the next thing. It says that Satan will lead those people and others to teach false Doctrine. First John chapter two verse eighteen says, "Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming." This this isn't necessarily a reference to the person of the Antichrist; it is a reference to people who are Antichrists. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Right? This is how we know it is the last hour. How do we know that it is the last hour? Because the Antichrists have come, meaning people who teach false doctrine, people who lead people astray from the Word of God. So when I when I get up here and preach and I say, "Hey, it's important that we read the Bible." And not necessarily listen to me. You don't want to know why? I want to make sure that you know that I'm not an antichrist. Like, that's it. Like, I know that's like a crazy and a loaded term in our world. Nobody says antichrist. Nobody think about Kurt Cameron and the left behind. But here's the, here's the thing. It's important. It's important that you know what the Bible says. Not what I say. Because my words are going to fall and fail and come short. So we need to get in the Word and, and know what the Word says. So he creates false ministers. He creates false doctrine. He, he takes on the form of false gods. He also creates false... Disciples. Matthew chapter 13 says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from an enemy did this he replies the servant asked him do, do you want us to go and, and pull them up he says no because while you are pulling the weeds you may root up the wheat with them let both grow together until the harvest at that time i will tell the harvesters first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned then gather the wheat and bring, into, bring them into my barn. This is a parable that Jesus teaches to, to show us that there's a lot of people that will be in the church, but they will not necessarily be of the church. He says it in another way, that there will be many that come to me on that day and they will say, Lord, Lord, and I will look back at them and I will say, I never knew you. Flee from me. And this is something we need to be aware of as the church. Like, this is something we need to, to understand that he raises up false teachers. He raises up false disciples. He then teaches false doctrine. And even false little G gods in this world are represented by the devil. 
Mark 4.15 says that He even snatches the Word away from people hearing the Gospel. And these are the ones along the path, He says, where the Word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the Word that is sown in them. We need to understand that Satan is not powerless. I think sometimes we in the church can, can have this position the, the, the battle, the war is won in Jesus, yes. But the battle is ongoing in our lives. The battle is ongoing around us. This past week in BBS, the battle was ongoing. As I had 34 students in this room and we preached the Gospel, the Mark 4.15 passage that Satan can come and steal away the Word is alive and well. As much as I don't want it to be true, it is important that you and I understand that he is not just some weak foe. Now, in light of Jesus, he is nothing. But as you read the story of Job and others in Scripture, when he stands with us, if we try to go toe-to-toe, it's not a good thing. Now, when we have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us, fighting on our behalf, winning those battles, then and only then can the devil be overcome. So you might be asking, okay, so we know who's against us, it's Satan. We kind of know who Satan is and kind of his, his tactics. Why then is Satan against us? I mean, why do you have to choose us, right? What's wrong with dolphins, you know? Why can't he take them? Well, here's the deal. Satan is against us because God is for us. And anything that God is for, Satan is against. Period. Paul in this portion of, of Colossians as we've been walking through, gives us two verses to enlighten us uh, of the struggle and, and the darkness that's around us. But the rest of those verses in, in that kind of paragraph, the majority of that text exists to point you back to Jesus. So we swing pendulums in life a lot, right? Like think about the way the world goes. Sometimes as Christians... We don't study Satan and, and maybe the enemy enough. And then there are other times when maybe we lean too much into the fallen and into the darkness. And so what Paul is trying to show us here, inspired by, the, by, by God himself, is that there, there's a healthy balance in this world. To know the enemy, but to connect and find your identity in Jesus, the victor. I want to read that text just one more, one more time so that we can kind of pick out some of the truths that Paul is teaching us. It says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord. So we know that he, he's talking to believers because these are people who have received Christ. He says to walk in Him, to be rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. So there's a baseline for your life when you, when you are When you are adopted, chosen, redeemed by Jesus, you are then called to walk in Him, to be rooted in Him, to have a firm foundation in Him. And he goes on to say, just as you were taught. So there implies that you need to be taught. That there, again, is another reference for the the body of Christ coming together and sitting underneath the preaching of the Word. Getting in small groups and and diving into God's Word. So we, we are adopted into His family. We then have a firm foundation as we are taught. And then abounding in thanksgiving to be thankful because the more we learn about God, the more that we can be joyful about God. The more we can be thankful that He took us from death to life. See to, see to it. So He gives you kind of your establishment of a, of, of, a, of a person in Jesus. And He says, see to it. No one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So, so basically... I've talked about it before, but it's, it's, you know, it's that opportunity as a, a freshman in college. You go to that class, and that f- professor tries to teach you all the reasons why Christianity is bunk, right? And he says, look, they're going to do this. Satan is going to try to take this, this, this attack at you, attack at your children. When you turn on the news, you're going to see this new finding and this new thing and that new thing. And every single one of these things has been authored by Satan. So don't fall into them because you've been rooted in Jesus. Like you have your firm foundation in who God is. He says, those are not according to how Christ works. Next verse, for in Him the whole fullness, in Jesus, the whole fullness 
of God dwells bodily. And you have been filled in Jesus, who is the head of all rule and authority. In Him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That means you've been grafted into this family, but putting on off the body of the flesh, meaning putting off the fallen nature by the circumcision of Christ. You have been buried with Jesus in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him. See, that's the greatest thing about Jesus, right? He didn't just say, hey, come and just like sit over here as a slave to me. He says, come and be a friend of God. Because you've been buried, but I've also then raised you up to walk with me. And I've equipped you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So whatever struggles you have in your life, whatever bondage you feel like you have, Jesus said it's been dead and buried. Now you raise and walk in newness of life. So don't, so don't stop looking back. Look forward. He's got a new way for you. He says you were dead in trespasses and in the, in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with Him, having forgiveness of all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt. The accuser can't come to you anymore because he's canceled it. When you stand before God the Father and He looks at you as a child of the living God, He does not see your fallenness. You know what He sees? He sees the blood of Jesus that covers all things. You are new in the eyes of God. The accuser can't come to you. There's nothing to say. He literally has no charge against you. So fight back. Because you say, I'm not innocent, but Jesus made me innocent. Praise the Lord. I don't need you. Get out of my life. You're not here. You're not welcome in this place. This temple is His. It's gone. No longer does it have a for sale sign on it. I am no longer dead. I am alive in Christ. He said He set all of those things aside and He nailed them to the cross. And then He says He disarmed the rulers and the authorities. And he put them to open shame. Every Good Friday, we talk about the shame that Jesus endured by having to carry his own cross, by being beaten, being scorned, being spit on, being mocked. And it's one of those moments, if you've been at a Good Friday service, or maybe you've just reflected on a Good Friday, or even the week before at a, at a church service, but you've just kind of taken in the weight of what Jesus went through that Friday, that open shame the shame that Satan receives is tenfold. It is nothing compared to what Jesus did. Jesus is putting him to shame. He's disarming him. And it says he triumphs over them in his work. So it's clear that we have struggles in this world. We're fallen, no doubt. But at every turn in your life, there's Jesus right there right where you need him. So are you leaning in to Jesus? Are you leaning into that supernatural power? Or are you resting on the natural power? Are, are, are you too caught up in the moment, in the suffering that you feel like you're in, in the pain that you feel like you're in, to, the Scripture says, look up to the heavens. Look towards God. Because Jesus changes everything. If He can change death to life, what can't He change in your life right now? Psalms 107, verse 10 says, Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. You, do you hear this? The people who have rebelled against God, God sent hard ways their, their, their side. And they fell down with none to help. See, sometimes we think of God as kind of standing back or He only ever gives good. Sometimes He allows struggle your way. So that eventually you can be formed into the image of His Son. It says, then they cried out to the Lord. These people who are against God, Right? Like, they, they want no parts. I don't want nothing from you. And so he sends hard times their ways. And what does it say? It says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death. And he burst their bonds apart. 
Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. For He shelters the doors of bronze and cuts into the barns of iron. There is no prison that you are in that you cannot be broken out of by Jesus Christ. There is not one. There is not a financial struggle. There is not an addiction. There is no relational mishap that you can't get out of by looking towards Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that the fallen things of this world won't affect you. Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. I think sometimes when we're in a bad place because of our poor decisions, we go, hey, Jesus, come fix this. And what fix this means to us is just get rid of all the worldly problems, right? Well, no, you reap what you sow. There are worldly problems. It is what it is. But you know what he can fix? He can fix your heart about it. He can fix your peace about it. He can fix your eternal place with him forever. Jesus makes the darkness tremble. Whatever bondage you have in your life, whatever sin is there, he says in, in John chapter 12, verse 6, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in the darkness. Wherever you find yourself this morning in the struggle of sin and, the, and the, the battle of your marriage, uh, a personal relationship, a friendship, your, your job, emotional health, mental health, wh wherever physical health, wherever you find kind of those prison walls, as the psalmist stated, know that Jesus can set you free. And all it takes is for you to come to the throne and say, I, I recognize that I am fallen, I am dead, I, I am a sinner of all sinners. But I recognize that you're good. And you can break every chain, you can tear every bondage, and you can separate sin as far as east is from the west. And I give my life to you. I follow you with everything that I've got. And I, I think sometimes as like Christian folks, we think, oh, that's just a one-time thing. That's just like this, I'm going to walk down an aisle, I'm going to get dunked, and it's going to be good. Man, I, I find myself having to look at Jesus every day and say, I'm giving my life to you. Now, I'm eternally secure, so don't, don't hear me say like I, I feel like I've lost my salvation. No, it's a reminder of where I am and, and who I serve. You know, we sing songs all the time about how He is our strength when we are weak. He is our all in all. He, he is everything to us. It is a declarative statement both to Him and to ourselves. Like we're singing that goodness over our lives. And so wherever you are this morning, whatever struggle you find yourself in, maybe you're not in a struggle. Maybe you're on a mountaintop. That's great. A struggle's coming. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It is what it is. But here's the deal. Jesus is with you if you'll let Him be there. If you'll say, hey, come on. I'll ride shotgun. In the words of Carrie Underwood, you take the wheel. Jesus is our everything. And we need to know who our enemy is. But I think more importantly, we need to know that he has thwarted that enemy. And we can stand firm and secure that Jesus makes the devil tremble. Let me pray. God, I thank you that we are not in this battle alone. That you have not just saved us and left us. But God, you've equipped us, you've called us, you've redeemed us, you've given us everything we need. Matter of fact, in your, in your word in Romans, you said that we're more than conquerors. And so God, I just pray that we'll function as that. We'll walk in that. We'll own that truth. That in you, in your Holy Spirit, we are more than conquerors in Christ. And just as sin came through one man, life came through another. And so, God, we lift up the precious and holy name of Jesus. If there's anyone in this room this morning that is struggling to see your goodness, they're focusing on the natural and not the supernatural, Lord, I, I pray that you'll just lift their eyes, remove the scales like you did from Paul, and you'll let them see the glory and the grandeur of who you are, that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All things are for you, held for you, move through you. And God, I pray that they'll surrender their life to you today and every day to come. We praise your precious name. And the church said,